Our first speaker, we have a full, full day today. We've got some really good panels. Our first speaker today is actually going to be Commissioner Adam Putnam. For those of you who were here the first time we met, uh, you may remember uh, he was actually our keynote speaker four years ago, uh, the first time we met here. So we're delighted to have him back. Uh, many of you know him. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on his resume, as it were. Um, he's basically, you know, he's, he's done it all when we're talking about government, either at the state or at the federal level. He served in Congress. He served in the State House. He's now serving in the executive branch uh, as the Commissioner of Agriculture. And uh, we're thrilled that he's here today. Um, in addition to being the Commissioner of Agriculture, he is one of the currently declared candidates for governor. Um, since we do not take political positions because of the nature of the organization we are, we invited all of the uh, declared candidates for governor that we thought had a reasonable shot at actually being elected. I believe that means we probably did not invite Senator Latvala this time. That's just the way it breaks sometimes. <coughs> and, excuse me. And we did have Congressman DeSantis who came yesterday, and we have the commissioner today. But Commissioner, if we can invite you up. We'd love to have you today. We're thankful you can be here. Hell of an introduction, Daniel. <laughs> Quite the litigator. You really know how to charm a jury. <clears throat> Thanks for letting a farmer come speak to you. Good morning. I, uh, it, it's my pleasure to be with you and, and to just uh, share a few thoughts with you about uh, my view of Florida and where we're going and how we get there together and, and, and what it means uh, for the future of our state uh, for generations to come. I think that. Uh, First of all, it's very magnanimous of you to, uh, to allow a non-attorney uh, ag economics major to be with you. Uh, Jason Gonzalez has been very kind in, in securing for me a, a quota for farmers, at the, farmer speakers at this. But um, I'm a fifth generation Floridian. I'm, I'm from a little town called Bartow. We have anybody here from Polk County? Uh, all right, yeah, we've got a few. I cut my teeth uh, as an intern <clears throat> for a guy named Charles Kennedy. So while I didn't go to law school, it was because I didn't have to after about three months of Charles Kennedy's constitutional law boot camp. And he does not suffer fools, let me tell you that. But uh, my background is in, in agriculture and in small business, served as commissioner. Uh, I have uh, read more than my fair share of, uh, of legal briefs for all the wrong reasons. Most, most recently, a god-awful decision by Walker on this clemency thing that is uh, pretty arrogant and egregious and represents an awful lot of what's wrong with judges who are trying to, uh, to make laws rather than tell us what the laws are and what the state's constitution is. My view is uh, that Florida is playing a very hot hand. Uh, Florida is a global brand. Florida is a place that here we are in, in the, the, you know, the happiest place on earth. Uh, people save all year to visit our state, the state we get to call home. They bring their kids here. And the memories that they make with their, with their children are so powerful that those children will bring their own children back a generation later to recreate the same experiences. That's our home. We live in a state that people spend a lifetime trying to figure out a way to get here. I mean, we, you know, we, it's 65 degrees, we pull out every jacket we own. <clears throat> There's some, there, there are a lot of poor schmoes all over the country right now shoveling snow, dreaming about being right here in the Sunshine State, wearing, wearing flip-flops in January, playing golf year-round. And I love that. I mean, as a guy who's been here for generations and who cares passionately about the future of our state, I love the fact that we are a state that people dream about, that we are a state that people reward themselves with, give themselves. They feel like they've earned Florida as a prize for a life well lived someplace else. But I want Florida to be more than that. And for us to make Florida more than that, Florida has to be the state that's the launch pad for the American dream. It's the place where people raise their families here. 
Cheer for our football teams, not who they're playing on that particular day. Or, our, or cheer for our baseball teams, not who their opponents are because they're from Philly or Boston or New York. Make Florida the launch pad for people to raise their families here, start their businesses here, grow their businesses here. And for that to be possible, first and foremost, they have to be safe. And the judiciary is critically important in making sure that people are safe. How many of you remember when the murder of two German tourists killed the tourism industry because people lost confidence in public safety, the most basic function of government in Florida? Today, crime is at a 46-year low because of our men and women in law enforcement, because of our prosecutors, because of the judiciary, and because we've built enough room at the end to keep the bad guys locked up. That really matters because you can't have good schools unless you have safe schools. You can't have a great business environment unless you have safe neighborhoods and safe communities. So that's job one, and we want Florida to be the number one state that recognizes the important contributions that our veterans, our military, our first responders make to keeping us all safe and protected and protecting our lives and our property. That's job one. The second piece of the puzzle is education. Daniel, you've led the charge to give our kids options so that families can customize learning. The education reforms that were made in the legislature and fought to secure in the courts have transformed the opportunities that our kids have to learn in the ways that are best suited to that individual child in our state. There are private schools in my community that have gone out of business because our public schools have gotten better. I'm a product of our public schools. My kids are in public schools. When I drop my daughter off at middle school, there's now yard signs in the bus drop off recruiting parents and recruiting students to different public magnet high schools that meet the needs of that child. Imagine that, recruiting students based on their academic needs. Is your child interested in the fine arts? Apply today for this magnet public school. Your child interested in accelerated learning? Apply today for International Baccalaureate. Your child interested in a uh, career in law enforcement in the military? Apply today for this magnet Summerlin Academy, a West Point style academic option. When I was in school, the only people who got recruited were quarterbacks and pitchers. <laughs> but that was a victory for competition and transparency and accountability that was fought for by Governor Bush, passed through the legislature, and continues to play itself out in courtrooms across the state. But it's so important that we not go backwards on giving our kids the options and the tools to succeed in this global economy so that they can compete and win. And here's the other piece of the puzzle. We have to be serious about workforce development. If we want to rebuild the middle class in Florida, then we have to stop telling all of our students that if they do anything other than get a four-year university degree, they're going to be a failure in life. That's flat wrong. Now, I know all of you committed yourselves to an awful lot of higher education, but too many of our students who could find great jobs in their community without having to move away are being told that they need to take out student loans for a degree they don't want and can't use when no one is telling them that the number one job vacancy in Florida is nursing. The number four job vacancy in Florida is a truck driver. And we have to put career and technical education back into our middle schools and back into our high schools and stop treating our community and state colleges like a redheaded stepchild. No offense to the speaker. <laughs> because that's how you keep our talented young people here. As it is, too many of them are ending up with the debt they're quitting early so they don't have the diploma, so they have the debt, no degree, and they're more liberal than when they started because of the influence of what they're getting when they hit these safe spaces in university campuses. <laughs> and the leader of our state has a critically important role in appointing people to the judiciary. And let me just share a few thoughts with, with you about my view of that. It is very important that we have talented people who are willing to serve on the bench. It is a public service, just like all the other forms of public service, including elected office in the legislative branch. But we want people who are going to serve on the bench who are there to interpret the law, not make it. If you want to make it, run for the legislature. If you want to interpret it, serve on the bench. That's my view, pure and simple. 
It's important that there be humility. I hate an arrogant uh, approach to public service. I think it's important that robitis be banned from the process and that the, and that the individuals who seek to serve in public life on the bench are involved in the community that they serve so that it's not some disconnect between what real families are dealing with, real communities are struggling with. There has to be roots in what's going on in that community. I think we get better decisions and I think we get uh, better, stronger communities when we have that type of character, values, and skills. Restraint, an originalist view of the Constitution, and the humility to know to stay in their lane if you want to make the law run for the legislature. If you want to interpret it, the bench is the right place for you. And we need all of you to be involved in that. And I can assure you that as a non-attorney, the people that I will be relying on for JNC appointments, for filling general counsel appointments throughout the executive branch, and for putting talented people on the bench, they will be the Federalist Society that we lean on for the type of talent, character, and values that we're looking for in those positions. It's just that simple. I believe that Florida deserves a leader who knows Florida best and will put Florida first. Somebody who knows the nuances and the differences between the courtrooms in Bartow or Bristol or Bluntstown and the courtrooms in Miami and St. Pete and Jacksonville. There are differences. Regional matters. It really does matter in a state the size of Florida. So the idea that the legislature's run out of problems to solve and we're now focused on central time must be heartening for the rest of the country to hear that we've run out of any other problem except for fixing time. I was in Pensacola last week. They said, stop messing with God's time. <laughs> These are the things that we can do together to build a stronger, better Florida. As a guy from a small business background, I want Florida to roll out the red carpet for small business. If you can take care of small businesses, big businesses will be fine. I want us to be unashamed to insert faith in action, in our prison system, in our human services, in our foster care, in our dependency, leaning on the communities to help us solve problems that government has struggled with forever, bringing conservative values, conservative character to everything that we do, from protecting our natural resources to ensuring a vibrant business community to having our kids have and our parents have the best opportunities and the greatest number of options, regardless of what their future holds. Maybe it's university bound, maybe it's law school bound, maybe it's vocational bound, but we will treat each of those students and give each of those students the tools that they need to be successful using the latest technology and attracting and retaining the best possible teachers who in many cases spend more time with our kids than we do. A couple years ago we were at the beach and, and uh, my daughter was playing with a little girl who was renting the house down, uh, down the way and she had a, a new lab puppy and the puppy, I noticed, was wearing a Fitbit on its collar. <laughs> so I asked my daughter, to the point about education innovation, I asked my daughter, what's the deal with the Fitbit on the, on the dog? And she said, oh, well, she's taking a uh, Florida Virtual School course uh, for PE, and she's behind in her steps. That little girl's going to do just fine in life. She is a problem solver. We have to give our kids the tools to be successful and the range of options, not just the university-bound students, not just the law school-bound students or the med school-bound students, all of our students, the tools to succeed. That's how we rebuild our small towns, and that's how we rebuild our inner cities. That's how we rebuild the middle class in Florida. Florida has to be more than, a, than uh, a frivolous lawsuit paradise. I mean, any of y'all drive down the turnpike to come here? I mean, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm still trying to figure out who I sue about a hurricane. <laughs> but according to a, about 150 billboards, I've got options. <laughs> That's not the kind of Florida 
that we're trying to create. And that's not the kind of Florida that I want to build as your next governor. All of us have chosen a life of public service. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't chosen a life of public service. Whether you're on the public payroll or not, you care about the future of Florida. You care about taking our state forward and solving our problems together. Not just a band-aid to get through the next election or the next fiscal cycle or the next election year, but really fixing Florida's problems so that we are more than a prize for a life well lived someplace else with a launch pad. And if we put Florida first, we'll be there together. You could have gone anywhere. Your degree, your talents, your skills, you could have put them to work anywhere. When a lot of us graduated, a number of us graduated together from Florida, we lost a lot of classmates to Atlanta, to Austin, to Charlotte, to Boston. You probably did too. They chose other firms and other cities because they didn't believe that Florida was the place for them to plant their flag and build their firm and raise their family. We've got to reverse that flow. That's what we can do together. Put Florida first so that young people are attracted to our universities and to our vocational schools and they stay here. That our brightest and best don't have to move away from home to find good careers and raise their families here in Florida. And we continue to be the place that people dream about, to visit, to move, to live. But they will be safe. They will have unfettered freedoms, unlimited economic opportunities, and the knowledge that conservative leadership makes a huge difference. And we chart a course for Florida that's the right path for Florida and not be pulled by the left into the types of abyss that New York, and Illinois and California find themselves in. The Florida way. We put Florida first. That's what this campaign's all about. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share with you. So I was asked to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Carlos Muniz. And it feels like I met Carlos only yesterday. And that's probably because I met him for the first time at the dinner. But <laughs> it was really nice because Carlos gave me uh, list of things to say about him, so I wouldn't be able to do it without that. <laughs> Carlos is smart, handsome, he went to Yale Law School, <laughs> and he moved to Florida in 2001 to work with Charles Kennedy in Governor Bush's legal office. Since then, he's held a variety of positions in state government. Re most recently, he was Chief of Staff to General Bondi. Since 2004, Carlos has been an attorney and consultant at McGuire Woods in Tallahassee. And last year, Carlos was nominated by President Trump to be the General Counsel to the United States Department of Education. Anything I missed? Thanks, Hayden. And thanks to Hayden and Daniel for putting together this panel. Um, as, as you all know, this, it's a really uh, timely pair of topics with Title IX and campus speech being something that um, isn't just of interest to lawyers, but is obviously of widespread interest kind of across the culture and across our country. Um, and I think they're both issues that touch on fundamental questions of our culture, our values, and uh, really basic questions of justice. Um, the topics are also timely because each of them has been a priority of the Trump administration. Um, Last September, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos announced that she would be revoking the Obama administration's uh, sub-regulatory guidance letters on campus sexual assault and that she would be initiating a rulemaking process to take another look at that subject. And um, any of you who were here for the panel last night uh, and heard Administrator Pruitt and Secretary Acosta, um, you know that in a lot of these things that the Trump administration is looking at, uh, the, the process and, and respect for the APA and, and doing things legally in the way that the administration feels is right is, is just as important to them as getting the substantive policy right. Um, in the speech uh, where she announced uh, her plan to, to address the issue, um, Secretary DeVos reaffirmed her commitment to combating campus sexual misconduct and she actually thanked the Obama administration for elevating the conversation and elevating uh, our 
awareness of that problem. Um, but she also emphasized due process in a way that uh, maybe hadn't been as much of a focus from, from the government before. Um, so I think we'll all be looking forward to learning more about that today from our panel and looking forward to the regulatory process as it goes forward in the, in the, in the coming year. Um, similarly, with the, in the free speech area, uh, Secret, uh, I'm sorry, Attorney General Sessions has made that a priority of his and has given a very high profile talk about that and uh, has also been getting involved in some cases involving that and we're going to hear in a lot more detail from Jesse about that today. So I'd like to introduce uh, our panelists. Um, we have Eamon Riscala, who's currently a partner at Ackerman, uh, where he focuses his practice on white collar criminal defense and investigations. Uh, early in his career, he worked for the Department of Homeland Security, where he handled international financial investigations throughout the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. Um, but something that's directly relevant to our panel today is in between those, those two experiences, he spent several years as an assistant general counsel at the University of Miami, uh, where he handled civil litigation and learned a lot about the issues that we'll be talking about today on the panel. Michael Morley is a law professor at Barry University School of Law, and in June he'll be moving up to Tallahassee to uh, take on a role as a law professor at Florida State. So welcome, welcome to Tallahassee. Um, he also has been a lecturer at Harvard Law School and special counsel to the Army General Counsel. Um, he also at one point was a litigator at Williamson Connolly up in D.C. Um, his research focuses on election law, remedies, federal courts, and constitutional law. And anyone who's interested in uh, some of the things Administrator Pruitt was talking about last night with uh, sue and settle and kind of collusive litigation between agencies and outside parties, he's written some uh, great work on that. And I think we, you learn a lot from, uh, from looking at his scholarship on that. Also, nationwide injunctions have been a, a big interest of his, which I'm sure you guys have been paying attention to as well. Um, Jesse Panuccio is currently the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General of the United States. Um, for anyone like me who's not an expert in the, the DOJ org chart, that means that he's the number two to the number three person at DOJ. <laughs> and he uh, oversees all of their civil litigating uh, components. Um, Jesse's well known to us here in Florida. He was a great public servant in the Sky administration, uh, first serving as deputy general counsel and general counsel, and then he went on to become for three years the executive director of the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, where he was kind of the point person <coughs> in a lot of the governor's highest priorities of job creation and economic development. Um, before joining the, the administration, um, Jesse was a litigator at Foley and Lardner in Miami and DC, and earlier in his career he litigated at Cooper Kirk in DC. Um, and I saved Nancy Hogshead Makar for last because I didn't want the other panelists to feel bad when I tell you that she's a three-time <laughs> Olympic gold medalist and a silver medalist for swimming. Anyone my age who grew, grew up in the 80s, immediately when we hear Nancy Hogshead Makar, we think of swimming and her great representation of our country there in the Olympics. Um, but she has gone on to become both an academic and a practitioner in a lot of the areas that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, on the academic front, she's a former tenured professor at Florida Coastal School of Law and has written extensively on Title IX. Um, she also is a practicing civil rights lawyer. Uh, she's the head of Champion Women, which is an organization that provides legal advocacy for uh, girls and women in sports. And most recently, and something that uh, is kind of an extra bonus for us since it's so timely, uh, she is going to talk about uh, her, uh, uh, some recently passed legislation up in Congress called the Protecting Young Victims from Sexual Abuse and Safe Sports Authorization Act, which I'm assuming it's something that you've been working on for a long time, but it, I think maybe the impetus for passing it now was the horrible uh, case involving Dr. Larry Nasser in Michigan State. And Nancy's been working on that, and so we'll be able to hear some, some, uh, some of the details on that from her. Um, so I think we'll start our, our panel today hearing from Nancy, and then move on to Jesse, and then Michael and Eamon. So if we could all welcome Nancy Hogshead Makar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
construction. Well, I'm gonna, uh, I came back last night uh, from our dinner and, um, put this up here, uh, and I completely reworked my entire PowerPoint and presentation because everybody convinced me that I really needed to talk about the Larry Nasser case and what was going on in this new legislation that we just got passed. Um, so this is what I had planned to, uh, to talk about. I'd really like to call out and thank my research assistant, uh, Sydney Rodkey. She's a third year law school student at the University of Florida. And um, she, uh, uh, she was a uh, varsity athlete uh, at Mississippi State who, um, was a, uh, who graduated with a 4.0 GPA. So, so she helped me a lot. <clears throat> with, a, <clears throat> with this PowerPoint, and you're going to get to see just how different that I made it. So first slide, please. This is all done at 11 o'clock at night with a few cocktails. Oh, clicker's here? Oh, thank you. There we go. Larry Nasser. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what the Me Too movement has done is allowed people to see just how ubiquitous that sexual harassment and sexual assault is in women's lives that it is, it is not something unusual for women, that it is part of their life's experiences, their lived life experiences. What the Larry Nasser case did was, it was the first time in history he accepted as part of his plea deal that he would listen to all of these victim testimonies. Initially, they only had about 20 women who were gonna be, be testifying, I'm gonna be saying something, most of them were done by number, but as they started going, more of them said, I'm gonna put my name down. More of them said, I'm gonna speak out. So we all knew who the victims were, but it turned out that last week it was 156, and we've got about another 100 coming today. And for the first time in our history, we've gotten to see just how damaging sexual abuse is. We kinda of know that it's horrible, but it's only in this hypothetical sense. What we got to see in all of these victims, one after the other, was just how raw and emotional that they were, and yet how powerful that they were in coming forward and really breaking all the norms of keeping this quiet. Um, so because of them, uh, because of the Me Too movement and now the Larry Nasser movement, I don't know how to put those two things together, but they're two very different phenomena, uh, this statute that we've been working on for a long time, this is something I've been working on for almost a decade. When I try to tell people that uh, the, the United States Olympic Committee and the national governing bodies deny any responsibility for handling sexual assault, for doing anything about it, it kind of like it glazes over them. You know, I taught torts law for 12 years, and you know, when you go over the no duty classes, remember back in the race, so we spent out three classes on the whole no duty rules. And what they were doing is taking advantage of these no duty rules to say, we may know about sexual abuse, we may know about what's happening, it's just not our job. We don't do that. We put Olympians on the medal stand. So even if we did know about it, you know, I, uh, in my sport of swimming, I would say between 10 and 20% of all my teammates were sexually abused by their coaches. My coach, my head coach, is on the banned list forever from coaching because he was molesting my teammate while I was doing it. And, but it wasn't the language like he's molesting this underage girl. How his language was, he was dating her. That was how it was normalized. Um, so there was a, you know, how it happens in every sport is very different. How girls and women get abused in sport is very different. But, it's, but it, it happens in every sport. So gymnastics is quite different from what happens in swimming. In swimming, a 14-year-old a is six feet tall. In gymnastics, a 14-year-old is um, you know, four foot six, right? So they look like tiny children, and as opposed to, right? But they're still 14 years old. They're still 15 years old. So this is, uh, I actually saw this. Uh, it went around Twitter. I probably saw it 100 times, and people were hot, shocked and horrified. And I've been saying, <laughs> I've been trying to tell you guys in law review articles, in lay articles, for ESPN, for athletic business, this was their legal strategy, was if we don't do anything about sexual abuse in sport, we can deny civil liability. So we can avoid, we can save ourselves a ton of money just by not accepting this duty to handle sexual assault. So this was their pleading out, you can't really see it from where you're talking, but the very first line says, uh, 
it says, um, it's too small here too. So, <laughs> but, but essentially it says, you know, we, we don't owe a, a duty to the, to the Nassar victims. You know, I'm really sorry it happened, okay? And this is exactly where schools used to be. Right now we have a, a coach that my organization has been trying to get out of coaching. This is a blatant pedophile. This is a bad guy. We're trying to get him out of coaching. Uh, he's already been kicked out of United States Volleyball once. His name is Rick Butler. We have written about 45 different letters. When we write them to schools, schools have general counsel positions. They have, uh, they have insurance. They have, um, they have Title IX. And so they like get on it. As soon as we give them the original source materials, you don't have to take our word for it. This is a bad guy here. That he is out. When we tell a club, the club comes back to us and says, how dare you interfere with my business? Uh, it, this is harassing behavior. And if you continue, I will call the police. <laughs> so, you know, like, well, I'm doing you a favor by, by giving you all this information because you really need to protect girls. They just had another hearing, so for the second time, he's now been kicked out of USA Volleyball uh, twice. Before they had three victims, now they have five, and I know of at least two more who were not at that time willing to come out. He is still coaching at the AAU. So he still has, he still coaches lots of underage girls. So this issue of how we handle sexual abuse in sports is, uh, has been going on for quite some time. The whole issue of sexual abuse, I have to say, is something I talk about every single day. My son, his, um, he gets to hear me on the phone when I'm doing interviews or, or trying to convince somebody to do what I want him to do. And uh, so he's been hearing about this all, all the time. If I post something on Facebook about sexual abuse, the first three reactions, I guarantee you, are going to be kill him, uh, put him in prison for the rest of his life, or a third is, um, is chop off his testicles. <laughs> and the, while those may be like, emotionally satisfying to think about all those things, in reality, Ray, uh, Larry Nasser, who now has 175 um, years in prison, uh, is the outlier. That's not going to happen. Most, most people, even if they're convicted of horrible child pedophile, even if they're a, a rapist, a serial rapist of adult women, and we know they don't lost, they don't spend much time in prison. So, so um, we have to be thinking strategically about what we can do to make the world safer for girls and women and for boys and men as well. So it is a yucky topic, but please move from the emotional part of your brain that's thinking, ah! to the thinking part of your brain, which that is the Federalist Society. So, um, so why is it important to address? Um, because it's one in five women, uh, women undergraduates, and 7% of college men will experience attempted or completed sexual assault while in college. Um, this has enormous consequences um, for the health, for economic and for educational. It's one of the, uh, mate, if, if a woman is sexually assaulted when she's employed, uh, she has a 50% chance of leaving that employment within one year um, because of the emotional ramifications of having been sexually assaulted. Um, so uh, the, the, the average, the, the price tag of what it usually costs for when somebody is sexually assaulted is $151,000. It is very expensive for women. They tend to drop out of school. Um, they tend to sort of go through this down period of, you know, they're, they're trying so hard not to feel how badly they feel, right? That they, they drink too much, they um, go out and party too much, they, um, they isolate in their rooms, they sort of get under the covers, they, right? And so consequently, their education really takes a dive. Uh, uh, all right, so which brings us to the Title IX and the preponderance of the evidence standard and why it is that we need to have uh, the, the statute. So you all know that Title IX is a federal law that is a quid pro quo, right? The government gives money in exchange for which the, the organization agrees not to discriminate. It's pretty simple. All right, so uh, it was started with um, Title VI. Title VI barred discrimination based on race color, national origin, and they just took out those four words and they put in the word sex and it's the exact same statute. Same thing with disability, a little more complex statute, and age discrimination. So you have four statutes, they all kind of go the same way. So when, usually when something happens to one, it happens to the other as well. So in the preponderance of the evidence standard, <clears throat> it's always used to adjudicate all of these, oops, back space, all of these <coughs> different kinds of claims. So when people are, um, 
are, uh, are when, when, when uh, it, it's, it's civil rights claims throughout the board. It's all in civil law generally. Um, it's true for any kind of student discipline. It's true for employee discipline or termination. And it's kind of like if, if you all are called in front of the Florida Bar, and uh, it, it is the preponderance of the evidence standard. It's, it's um, uh, you know, those of you who practice in civil court, it is the preponderance of the evidence standard that is used. And, um, okay, so let's talk about your hypothetical uh, student. The hypothetical, stu hypothetical student is accused of several things, plagiarism, drunken disorderly, theft, dealing drugs, a bomb threat, a weapons charge, physical assault, or sexual assault, okay? They all have very negative reputational effects, right? Okay, so why, so is schools, they discipline students all day, every day for all these things. I had the privilege of getting to work with University of Colorado for five years after Lisa Simpson was raped by football recruits and uh, I got to see the, how their disciplinary process works on a, you know, everything from cheating to plagiarism to, again, they did have bomb threats, they did have weapons charges, they did have, right? So why would we carve out one kind of crime or, or one kind of, of misconduct for a student and take that away from schools when they have to deal with this kind of crime all the time, day in, day out? <clears throat> All right, so let's look at uh, different kinds of, of, uh, of due process. Due process is a sliding scale. We tend to think of it as like this blanket, like everybody's owed due process. What is due process? If you're accused of a capital crime, you get a ton of due process, right? It immediately goes, I mean, you have to have a special lawyer that's certified to be able to handle a, 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 a death penalty case. It goes directly to the Supreme Court. 40% of their docket is, is um, death penalty stuff, right? You get a ton of due process. Uh, in civil court, much less. Okay, so all of the protections that the Constitution, when it's the big bad government coming after the individual, that we want to make sure that we get it for sure, for sure right. And guess what? We don't always get it right, even when we do give these people all of these protections here. But in civil law, you'll see that, uh, that people get much less protection, and it's, and it, which makes sense because it's citizen versus citizen. So one citizen says, you owe me $10,000. No, you owe me $10,000. So why should the scales be weighted on any one particular side? Okay, It's just it's a 50-50 type of balance. Um, same with administrative law. Uh, and typically, in administrative law, you're entitled to notice in a hearing um, and, and have an impartial decision maker. And usually, that's about it. Uh, for, for HR departments, for non-unionized employees, uh, they're entitled to even less. Okay, even if their contract says that they can only be fired for cause. So, right, when you look at like how is due process, uh, how it's this sliding scale, and how there are all these different ways that, uh, that, that one bad action can result in lots of things happening, right? So if you all, if you steal money from a client, you may go to prison, you may get, uh, have a civil claim against you, and you may lose your license. Okay, so all three things can all be happening at the same time. We have sort of these layers uh, of things happening. We don't rely on any one system. Um, I, I think I'm gonna, this is, that's my time, and I think I'll rest right there to say that, that um, Title IX, that the, the, the standards that Title IX in the 2011 Dear Colleague letter and the 2015 uh, question and answer session, a uh, question and answer, document, um, they, 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 they more fully explained what it was that the Department of Education was doing, including under the Bush administration. So there's nothing that contradicts what happened with the Bush administration. It was more further clarification of here's what the department actually does. And, um, and when you think of sexual assault in higher education, I want you to think of you know, I think of my 17-year-old son, I think of my twin daughters, it's a 50-50. One of them is probably going to leave the school. It's no accident that the, these cases started happening in the country's best schools. People had worked very hard to get into Harvard and Yale and Columbia and Brown and Stanford, right? That they ha started happening in those schools because the women said, the victim said, I want to be at this school. I've earned the right to be able to be here and I can't get my education as long as my assailant is still here. 
And so, so one, if one of them is going to leave, then it makes sense to have a system where they both have the same right. So if one of them has a right to a lawyer, they both get a right to a lawyer. If one of them has a right to appeal, they both have the right to appeal. Right? They, right, so you want to make sure that, that the, these two parties, just like in civil law, that they stand in equal position of, to each other. Okay? So, um, and I think that when we think about how it is that we want to protect, um, you know, everything from athletes to students to people who are in employment, uh, right? When you look at all of those together, when you think about people who are independent contractors, such as people who are in the media industry, we want to figure out what are, how do we come up with uh, rules of law and systems that protect um, uh, people from sexual harassment and assault. It's a type of sex discrimination so that people can, so, right, so our economy can get going and people can be more productive and they can be more in the workforce. And, um, and I, you know, and, and, and that's really what the 2011 Dear Colleague letter was all about. So thank you all very much and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you, Nancy. And just for, just for uh, context, and I think we'll be able to flesh this out uh, maybe in the Q&A and in and, and the discussion with the panelists before, but um, what Nancy was referring to with this preponderance of the evidence standard uh, is that in the Obama administration, as she was saying, uh, their position was that Title IX required schools to use a preponderance of the evidence standard when they were adjudicating these sexual misconduct cases. Um, in the interim guidance that the Betsy DeVos and Trump administration have given, they have given schools the option of doing either a preponderance or a clear and convincing standard. Um, and one of the things I'd be curious to hear about from the folks who work in this area is my impression is that most schools in reaction to now having the option to use either standard have stuck with preponderance anyway. Um, and so it'd be interesting to hear people's thoughts on, on why that is. Uh, but our next speaker will be Jesse Panuccio, who will tell us about what DOJ is doing in the free speech area. Thank you, Carlos. Appreciate that. Let me just first say, uh, so thrilled to be here. Like many of you, nothing I'd rather be doing on a Saturday morning, 10 a.m., in a suit in Orlando, talking about important topics. So. Um, really, it is a testament to what they've, no, I'm serious, I mean, think about that. It's a testament to Jason and Daniel and Lisa and Leonard and everybody who put this together. So congratulations to them and thank you for putting together such a wonderful conference. Um, so if you look at your program, you'll see this uh, panel was called the First Amendment slash Title IX and Due Process on the, uh, at the universities. So I'm the first half of that slash, so I'm not going to be responsive to anything you said, Nancy, although it's always great <laughs> to, to hear you speak. Um, so uh, I'll just talk until you tell me it's 12 minutes or so, and then I'll see where it, where it stops. But uh, uh, last September, Attorney General Sessions gave a speech at Georgetown University, and Carlos mentioned that. Uh, and the Attorney General declared that freedom of thought and speech on the American campus are under attack. He announced that action to ensure First Amendment rights is overdue, and that the Department of Justice will do its part to enforce federal law defend free speech, and protect students' free expression from whatever end of the political spectrum it may come. Thus, in the last six months, the, Depart the Civil Rights Division of at DOJ has filed statements of interest in three cases alleging First Amendment violations at state-run institutions. I'll give you a quick uh, summary of those. In a lawsuit against the University of California, Berkeley, the department supported plaintiffs' challenges to the school's policies that vested discretion in administrators to decide, based on subjective factors, which speakers face severe restrictions and which will not. In a lawsuit against Pierce College in Los Angeles, the department supported the claims of Kevin Shaw, who challenged the school's limiting of free expression to a 616 square foot, quote, free speech area, end quote, where, even in that cram zone, all speakers must obtain prior authorization from the administration for what they want to say. And in a lawsuit against Georgia Gwinnett College, DOJ supported plaintiff's challenge to the school's student code of conduct, which prohibits speech that, quote, disturbs the comfort of persons, end quote. In this particular case, the college forced the plaintiffs to stop speaking publicly about their religious beliefs because other students had complained. 
We argued in our statement of interest that this policy and practice constitute an, an impermissible heckler's veto and is not content neutral. So those are the headlines of what DOJ has done thus far, but I want to dig a little bit deeper into this question about free speech on college campuses. What exactly was the Attorney General talking about? What would compel the Attorney General of the United States, with all of his responsibilities, to conclude that was important for him to announce that the Justice Department was going to make protection of free speech on college campuses a priority for this administration? Let me focus on four points if there's time. One, what's actually happening on campuses right now in the free speech area? Two, why is it happening? Three, why does it matter? And then if there's time, I want to offer some responses uh, to some rejoinders you sometimes hear when we talk about this debate. First, what is happening on college campuses? You've probably heard of a few incidents in which provocateurs from cable news or maybe uh, fringe ideologues were met with protests and canceled their speeches. Those instances certainly grab headlines, but they are not, they are not the main symptoms of the campus free speech crisis. The problem runs much, much deeper. Let me provide a few examples. First, speech codes. According to a recent survey by the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, nearly one third of institutions have speech codes that substantially infringe on constitutionally protected speech. Even more alarming, according to a 2016 Gallup poll, nearly 70% of students believe universities can restrict, quote, language on campus that is intentionally offensive, end quote. Now think about that for a moment. In the United States, the society that has been more protective of free speech than any in the history of the world, nearly one third of institutions of higher learning ban certain speech, and most students, 70%, believe that's just fine. Thus, at Clemson University, for example, we find a public institution that bans, quote, any verbal act which creates an offensive educational, work, or living environment. But who's to decide what is offensive and what is favorable, what is grading, and what is good? For example, does it create an offensive living environment at Clemson to say, go Gamecocks? For many Clemson Tigers, I am sure that would be the case. Administrators would likely dismiss any such complaint as frivolous, reasoning that such a statement is not the kind uh, of a sp offensive speech that they intended. But that subjective judgment is the very problem. Speech and civility codes like these at public institutions like Clemson violate what Justice Scalia rightly called the first axiom of the First Amendment, which is that as a general rule, the state has no power to ban speech on the basis of its content. Now, I used this example in a recent speech out at Northwestern University, and Clemson responded in the Chronicle of Higher Education by stating that the university, quote, interprets and applies its policies concerning speech, including this provision of our student code, in a manner consistent with the law, including the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. But if that is Clemson's position, why not amend the policy to actually comport with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution? <laughs> rather than through some promised but unwritten interpretation. As the Supreme Court explained in Reno versus ACLU, quote, the vagueness of a content-based regulation raises special First Amendment concerns because of its obvious chilling effect on free speech. So that's the first way, speech codes. A second way schools are, imposing, uh, are suppressing free expression, expression is by limiting free speech to so-called free speech zones which often comprise ludicrously small areas of campus. The aforementioned Pierce College in LA is but one example. Now these cramped zones are eerily similar to something the US Supreme Court said in the seminal 1969 case of Tinker about student speech. Quote, freedom of expression would not truly exist if the right could be exercised only in an area that a benevolent government has provided as a safe haven. Third, some campuses impose, subject, uh, impose subjective permit or permission requirements. A good example is found at Berkeley, which recently adopted a major events policy under which the university can impose significant barriers to a speaking event if administrators determine that any of a number of subjective factors might be uh, met. For example, that the event might interfere with campus functions or activities. Uh, these kinds of policies, again, chill speech because they're completely subjective in the application by administrators. In fact, Berkeley administrators might heed the advice of Walter in The Big Lebowski, if there's any Big Lebowski fans out there. He said, for your information, the Supreme Court has roundly rejected prior restraints. Still true, even at Berkeley. 
Fourth, let me address the heckler's veto. In recent months, this has been the speech suppression tactic most visible and most dangerous. The heckler's veto occurs in two ways, either when campus authorities prohibit speech in advance, professing fear of how objectors might respond, or when authorities permit objectors to overrun speakers during an event without consequence. The events last year at Middlebury College are a stark example. Student protesters violently shut down an event featuring an invited speaker and one of the school's own professors. As soon as the event began, the protesters shouted for 20 minutes, preventing the debate from occurring. When the debaters attempted to move to a private broadcasting location, the protesters pulled fire alarms, stalked after them, surrounded them, and began physically assaulting them. During the melee, one, professor, uh, one protester grabbed the professor by the hair and twisted her neck. She suffered a concussion and required a neck brace. When the debaters tried to escape the siege by car, the protesters pounded on the vehicle, rocked it back and forth, and jumped on the hood. In short, to shut down an ac academic debate at a major American college. Protesters, uh, excuse me, in short, to shut down the academic debate, Middlebury <laughs> students engaged in a violent riot, potentially breaking numerous laws and causing serious injury. Now in response, Middlebury merely placed a disciplinary note in some students' files. Not a single suspension, not a single expulsion, not a single arrest. Students physically assaulted their professor, sending her to the hospital, and the most the school could muster was an apology and a stern warning. These protesters engaged in allegedly criminal conduct that should have been dealt with as such. Instead, the administrators allowed an unruly mob to run the campus they are supposed to supervise. And this was not an isolated incident. Similar mob rule has broken out at Berkeley, at Evergreen State College, at William & Mary, to name just a few. Now, to be sure, protesting or otherwise challenging a speaker can be in and of itself a valid exercise of free speech and can help create the kind of debate that is the bedrock of American society. And as relevant here, the bedrock of academic inquiry. But that is not what's happening on college campuses today. As some Middlebury professors stated after last year's events, quote, a protest that prevents campus speakers from communicating with their audience is a coercive act, end quote. Hecklers are imposing silence on others, so only their own speech can be heard, and they are willing to use any means, including crimes of violence, to achieve this censorship. So those are the four broad categories I wanted to talk about uh, that I think should concern those who care about the First Amendment. But I also want to note that these are just the most easily identifiable methods of speech suppression on campus. As anyone who has spent any time on campus in recent years knows, free thought and expression are suppressed in much subtler ways, much subtler ways on a daily basis. Through hiring practices, course offerings, extracurricular funding, speaker series, disciplinary actions through all the daily, often invisible practices and acts that make up university life, you can now often find adherence to certain dogmas prioritized over the freedom to dissent. I could go on citing example after example, but the bottom line is that there is a free speech crisis on our college campuses today. Now, how much time do I have? Any left? You have a few minutes. Okay, a few minutes. So, everything I just said, those are the symptoms of the crisis. I want to talk briefly about now what I think the causes of the crisis are. For that, let me turn then to this second major point. Why is this happening? The root cause of the free speech crisis, I think, is that we no longer have broad agreement on the purpose of a university. And we no longer have broad agreement on the student's place within the university. First, the purpose of a university. Recall that one of the foundational principles of the university is academic freedom, the right to pursue knowledge and engage in scholarly inquiry without fear of reprisal. You can trace this all the way back to 1155. Academic freedom has a long pedigree when a group of scholars petitioned the Roman emperor at the time, Frederick I, for an edict that would protect them when they're on the road traveling to and from universities. And over the centuries, the idea of academic freedom blossomed and solidified so that the, by the time Thomas Jefferson founded UVA, he would commit in a letter of 1820 that the institution would not be, quote, afraid to tolerate any error so long as reason is left free to combat it. Jefferson was saying that the campus would enshrine the right to be wrong, to hypothesize, to error, and to use reason uh, to refine error into truth. Indeed, this freedom is at the very root of the scientific and academic inquiry. 
The scientific method, for example, proceeds through efforts to falsify a hypothesis. Just as Frankfurter picked up this theme in his concurrence in 1957 in Sweezy versus New Hampshire, he said, quote, insights into the mysteries of nature are born of hypothesis and speculation. He goes on to quote approvingly a then recent statement of South African scholars who were fighting for academic freedom and against apartheid policies in two of the uh, nation's universities. They said, quote, a university is characterized by the right to examine, question, modify, or reject traditional ideas and beliefs. Dogma and hypothesis are incompatible, and the concept of an immutable doctrine is repugnant to the spirit of a university. So let me just repeat that. Dogma and hypothesis are incompatible. Unfortunately, it is difficult to characterize the modern American university as embracing this creed. In, its pla in the place of the spirit of free inquiry, we now see a focus on feelings. <coughs> that feelings and not reason should dictate what is said on campus and the obligations of members of the university community. And so I'll just close with this and then I'll leave uh, rebuttal of the rebuttals to the question and answer. Uh, I think in addition to the loss of a common understanding of the purpose of university, we also seem to have a loss of agreement regarding the student's place within the university. Historically, young adults were seen to arrive on campus as pupils whose minimal life experience necessarily meant that university life, with all of its new experiences, social interactions, and novel academic inquiries, would challenge them, catalyzing growth and change. Said differently, universities were supposed to make students uncomfortable, to teach them that they didn't spring upon the world at 18 years of age, fully formed with all of the answers and far-reaching wisdom. That shared understanding of what the student is is quickly disappearing. In its place comes the idea that teenagers are already worldly when they first cross the university gate, and that campus is simply to be a comfortable halfway house between the family home and the first apartment of a 20-something. With that, uh, thank you very much, and I'll leave the rest for Q&A. Mm -hmm. For this panel, I, I watched a little video <coughs> that um, now Professor Michael McConnell, but then Judge, who Jesse Clerk for was doing on this, he gives a lot of talks on free speech and appears on, on a lot of panels on this. And he talked about speech codes and he talked about the lack of intellectual diversity at a lot of universities, but he said that the, in his view, the number one threat to free speech on campus is actually other students. Um, and I think he was talking about a lot of the kind of subtle things that Jesse was getting at and hopefully the litigation and, and all the sort of bully pulpit type stuff that um, AG sessions and people like Jesse are doing will maybe have an effect of getting students to think about some of these issues and maybe uh, some of the polls about uh, students' openness to restricting speech won't be, you know, the results won't be as scary as they seem to be now sometimes. Um, with that, uh, if we could hear from uh, Professor Michael Morley. Good morning. I'd like to thank Elena, Hayden, Carlos, and everyone else who's worked to organize this amazing event. I'm also very grateful to all of you who chose to skip breakfast at Chef Mickey's or your extra magic hours over at the Frozen Ride to join us here. And this is an amazing event. I've, I've, I've already learned. Imagine how fit I could be if I just thought to put my Fitbit on a dog. I'd be in much better shape right now. I'll begin by commenting on the Title IX issue of sexual harassment on college campuses before returning to the First Amendment questions raised by controversial speakers on college campuses. Title IX, as we've discussed, prohibits discrimination based on sex, including sexual harassment by faculty or students, in educational institutions that receive federal funding. The Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights, OCR, requires schools to conduct a prompt, thorough, and impartial investigation of any complaints. In 2011, the Obama administration's OCR issued its infamous Dear Colleague Letter, which required schools to eliminate or reduce many procedural protections for accused students. Schools that failed to comply faced a loss of federal funds, and hundreds of schools were ultimately placed under investigation by DOE to ensure compliance. 
The letter was revoked in 2017, but as Carlos had mentioned, many schools have chosen to still continue to voluntarily comply with its standards, and some go even further. It should go without saying that colleges face multiple important priorities that can sometimes appear to be in tension with each other. Providing a safe environment for all students, in particular by combating sexual assault. Preventing sex-based discrimination against either male or female students. And ensuring that students' educations, careers, and potentially even the course of their lives are not ruined by erroneous expulsions or other determinations of guilt concerning horrific sexual assault offenses. Beyond the potential shortcomings in the procedures mandated by the 2001 guidance that we've, that we've been discussing, I'd like to suggest there are three main areas that warrant careful consideration. First, one main source of difficulty in sexual assault cases, above and beyond deficiencies in the procedures that schools might choose to apply, is the substantive standard itself that some colleges have adopted for determining what constitutes an impermissible sexual assault or otherwise prohibited act. Some schools have moved toward adopting policies that require a student to receive express affirmative consent before initiating or escalating certain types of sexual contact. While such bright line standards seek to further admirable goals, they can be problematic because they effectively outlaw a substantial amount of contact that most people would not deem to be blameworthy or non-consensual, and such broad standards inevitably will be enforced selectively. On the other hand, vague standards that prohibit conduct based primarily on a participant's subjective participations or feelings without regard to whether they are objectively reasonable can lead to discipline even for apparently consensual conduct. Also problematic are standards that allow one participant in a sexual encounter to be disciplined when both were drinking and apparently actively participating in such conduct. Second, we must carefully consider the role that courts can play in reviewing both private and public colleges' disciplinary decisions in these cases. Most litigation tends to focus on a lack of procedural fairness. Courts are far more reluctant to reconsider the substantive accuracy of a college's decision. When they do, they are often highly deferential to college decision makers. The Second Circuit, in its influential ruling in Yusuf versus Vassar College, held that even an erroneous decision to discipline a student does not violate Title IX unless it arose from gender bias. So an important question is colleges become more willing to impose severe discipline on students accused of sexual, uh, of sexual offenses is the extent to which courts should be willing to step in to review and the appropriate level of deference at which courts should review colleges' substantive determinations. And third, relatedly, a substantial challenge in these cases sometimes concerns the college decision makers themselves. Consider Doe versus University of Cincinnati, in which the issue was whether sex between two students had been consensual. A college panel suspended the accused student for a year following a hearing at which the only evidence was a written report from Title IX investigators and the accused's testimony. The complainant did not show up, did not provide live testimony, and the student could not cross-examine any adverse witnesses. The Sixth Circuit characterized it as a he said, she said situation with no physical evidence. The court correctly held that the student had been denied due process and entered a preliminary injunction barring the school from imposing its punishment against him. But there's a concern that a, even a procedurally proper hearing in such a case would have been mere theater, with university officials reaching the same conclusion they were clearly predisposed to enter, even without hearing most of the relevant evidence firsthand. Turning to the First Amendment issue, one of the most important and fascinating issues implicated by attempts to present conservative speakers on campus is the issue of security costs. When a controversial speaker is invited to appear, it often can be expected that large, potentially violent protests will arise. 
The, an issue that many colleges has raised is whether either the speaker, him or herself, or the sponsor, the group that invited the speaker, can be required to pay the attendant security costs as a condition of allowing the presentation to proceed. In Forsyth County versus National Movement, the US Supreme Court held that the government may not impose a sliding scale of costs based on the content of a person's speech, including whether or not that speech is considered controversial. The court emphasized that additional costs may not be imposed based on the public's reaction to the speech. The court explained, listeners' reaction to speech is not a content-neutral basis for regulation. Speech may not be financially burdened any more than it can be punished or banned simply because it might offend a hostile mob. And yet, particularly for, school, for smaller schools, for schools in smaller towns, they can't afford to spend all of their resources or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars continuously providing security costs for, on controversial speakers. So we see a tension between two lines of Supreme Court cases. On the one hand, public forum cases recognizing that content-based discrimination and access to public fora is unconstitutional, violates fundamental First Amendment principles. Yet on the other hand, we see First Amendment case law saying that the government is not required to subsidize the exercise of rights, in particular, to subsidize speech. And that line of authority comes into particular play where this, a school selectively waives security costs, either for particular groups or for favored speakers. One potential response would be whether, rather than focusing on the speaker or on the sponsor of the, of the organization, the, uh, the focus on security costs instead could be focused on the counter-protesters, that to the extent that it is the counter-protest that raises the potential for violence, that raises a need for additional security, perhaps the security costs can be shifted to the counter-protest. Regardless, it is imperative that we focus not just on whether speakers are allowed on campuses, but the conditions upon which they are permitted to appear to ensure that public fora truly are preserved as expressions for First Amendment fundamental debate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Um, now we can hear from Eamon Riscala. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank the Federal Society for having this great conference and allowing the universities to present their perspective on the issue. Um, I would like to begin, I, th I thought it was appropriate to begin with a quote from Donna Shalala, the former president of the University of Miami, where I had the pleasure of being in AGC for, the, for five years. She once said, you can't have a university without having free speech, even though at times it makes us terribly uncomfortable. If students are not going to hear controversial ideas on college campuses, they're not going to hear them in America. And I want you to think about that. This is coming from a president of a major research university. Throughout the course of this morning, you've heard basically what I, I deem to be universities are getting vilified. And they're trying to suppress free speech. But one of the things that you have to keep in mind is there are two categories of universities. You have your public and you have your public, and your private. Their, their conduct, the, for the public ones, we all agree, subject to strict scrutiny for any restraint on free speech. Now for the private ones, they have the benefit of, they can set their own rules, their own policies, their own procedures. You may not like it, but that is what the Constitution allows for. It allows private entities to set their own rules. Now, I say all this, but there's always an exception to every rule. Private universities in California are subject to the same First Amendment requirements as public <coughs> universities. Because back in 1992, the California legislature issued what is known as Leonard's Law, which basically gave students and faculty at private universities the very same protections that the First Amendment provides. Now, Stanford University is the only university that's been sued under Leonard's Law, to my knowledge. And they lost because they had a speech code that was restrictive and under strict scru scrutiny testing, they failed. Now, what we also have to be cognizant of is that private universities 
unilaterally have tried to go out of their ways to reaffirm the principles that universities are bastions of intellectual debate. Indeed, back in 2014, the University of Chicago commissioned a committee on freedom of expression and, re and drafted what has become known as the Chicago Principles. Now, what do those principles say? In sum, they say that it is not the proper role of the university to attempt to shield individuals from ideas and opinions they find unwelcomed, disagreeable, or deeply offensive. Rather, the university's fundamental commitment is to the principle that debate or deliberation may not be suppressed because the ideas put forth are thought by some or even by most members of the university community to be offensive, unwise, immoral, or wrong-headed. It goes on to place the burden of that determination on the individual community member, whether it be a student or a faculty. And it is interesting that as of November 2017, uh, approximately 33 universities have adopted these principles. They include universities such as Princeton, Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, Vanderbilt, and Columbia. Now these are all private universities who are not obligated to even adopt these principles. But by adopting them, they've exposed themselves to certain obligations and commitments, and therefore lawsuits for potentially breach of contract. When a student is selecting a university as an undergraduate, they have access to the university policies. They can open it. Look, here's the student handbook. Here are the obligations and restrictions that are placed upon me if I choose to attend this university. That, you, that student handbook becomes, in effect, a contract between the university and the student. And, you, and all of a sudden, the private universities that have adopted these principles have reaffirmed their commitment to provide free speech. And therefore, if they restrict a student group from bringing on a controversial speaker, the, that student group now has a breach of contract claim where they would not have had it before at a private university. And I'm focused on private universities mainly because there's no controversy as the public university. Everyone knows they're obligated to, do, to abide by the First Amendment. Now, regardless of whether the uni universities have adopted the Chicago principles or not, there are certain practical considerations to, to consider. My colleague here just mentioned the cost of security. That is no small feat. To give you some perspective, last year, UC Berkeley, in a span of just five months, spent $2 million on the security. Now, that got broken down. In, they started in August with $600,000 in security fees during the weeks leading up to a proposed Ann Coulter speech which was eventually canceled. They then paid an additional 500,000 in September for a speech by Ben Shapiro, which, and then following that, 10 days later, an additional $800,000 for a 15 minute meet and greet with Milo Yiannopoulos. These are no small dollar figures. Whether public or private, universities are, their budgets are strained. Public universities are subject to the public purse strings. Private universities, where do they get their funds? Guess what? Tuition. In the smaller colleges, they just don't have the resources to provide these, this, this level of security on a constant basis. So what security costs, they can't be used as a function, as a weapon against a university, public or private, I would argue. Because at the end of the day, do you want students and protesters to bankrupt a university? I mean, that's what we're talking about. At a small private college that can't afford a $2 million bill in a span of five months, what happens? They either ban the speech or, alternatively, shift the costs. And that is a conversation that's, that administrators are more than happy to have. Administra now, I make a distinction between administrators and faculty members. There's always a tension between the two. And when I say administrators, I'm talking about the president's office, the provost, and not necessarily the faculty, who are the ones teaching the, uh, the students and pushing their agendas. Now, even if you figure out how to provide for the security costs, which are no small dollar figures, let's look, what do administrators also need to do? They you generally try to provide an alternative outlet for the students. So you have a controversial speaker, uh, speaker coming who's going to speak on X. You provide an alternative speaker who's going to speak on the exact opposite. 
Um, and that system does work. I want to give you an example. In the spring of 2017, Gettysburg College invented, invited Robert Spencer, who's the director of Jihad Watch. As you can imagine, there was tremendous protests and opposition to his presence. They saw, people deemed him to be an Islamophobe. He deemed all Muslims to be terrorists, and the community was outraged. But how did Gettysburg College handle this? Because you didn't really hear about this in the press, because they controlled the riots. They controlled everything. One, they hired sufficient security. But more importantly, the weeks leading up to it, they invited several speakers that would exact, provide the opposite viewpoint and allow the students to engage and express their, their positions, thus, to some degree, taking the steam out of the protest. Now, they also had security protocols that all the student administrators, the faculty, and everybody was made aware of. It was a unified approach to security. They involved every level, faculty, administrators, police, local, campus, all levels of police departments. They banned all backpacks, water bottles, and to address the heckler's veto where they, students did want to go into the arena and scream him down and not allow him to speak, they were kicked out of the arena immediately. So there are mechanisms by which universities do go out of their way to try to allow for free speech. You know, at the end of the day, administrators want to do the right thing. They recognize that universities are there to provide an intellectual debate. But at the end of the day, they also have some realities to face between security and making their students comfortable. And that is no small feat. So I, don't, so I want to leave you with this thought. When you're, when you're attacking a university or challenging a university on free speech basis, put yourself in the shoes of the university or an administrator. What are you going to do? How are you going to make all your students happy and your faculty and provide for security for, your, for everyone. Because at the end of the day, if something goes wrong, it happened on your campus, and you're liable for the, any uh, consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've got about 15 minutes left, and I thought I would first ask if any of the panelists have any response or any comments that they'd like to uh, make to any, what any of the other panelists said, and if not, we can, I've got a question, and then we can um, hear questions from the audience. No? Okay. Let me ask Michael and Nancy a, a question, because based on their presentations, I, I, th I don't know, because I haven't asked them before, but I think they might have a, a different answer to this. Um, given that the Department of Education is going to be doing rulemaking in, in the Title IX area this coming year, um, I'd be curious to hear each of your thoughts on what your sort of top one or two kind of hopes or priorities would be for what you would like to see come out of that rulemaking. And we'll start with Nancy. Sure. <clears throat> well, can you hear me? <clears throat> so first of all, in my remarks, I was remiss in not thanking my husband <laughs> for uh, helping me with my presentation and for, uh, for having me here. The reason why I know everybody here is because of him. So uh, Scott Maycar over there, thank you very much. Um, what I would hope would come out of it is, uh, is that, that the 2011, and 2011 Dear Colleague letter and the 2015 question and answer would get put back in place or their equivalent. That, um, that when the, the policies are given this, this opportunity to uh, have all sides heard, that um, the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, that the preponderance of the evidence, the amount of due process that's, that's owed, and this uh, prompt and equitable, meaning both sides uh, have the same rights, will prevail. Um, if one party has the right to appeal, the other party has the right to appeal. And um, so I would, I would hope that that is what would happen. Because, um, you know, in this country, typically how people get ahead is through education. And one of the surest ways to stop somebody's educational and professional trajectory is through sexual assault. So um, because of those, because of like the weighing, um, I, I would hope that we would make sure that college campuses would be doing their job. The same thing, we just passed a statute on Monday 
that requires the, so th there's the United States Olympic Committee, then there's 47 different sports, the national, they're called national governing bodies, so swimming and gymnastics and table tennis and luge and skiing and right, all those different sports. We just require them to do essentially what schools are required to do, which is to educate their members, to, um, to predict and prevent and when they get a complaint, to adjudicate that complaint and get them out of sport. Okay, so we just passed a statute saying that exact same thing. Uh, and it was passed overwhelmingly, it was unanimous in the Senate, and there were only three dissents in the House. So this was a bipartisan vote that uh, just happened. So that's what I would like to see happen. Thanks, Carlos. And let me ask you, I, just from some of the summaries and the coverage of that, of that bill that I read, I, one of the obligations is that um, is it imposes a duty to report to law enforcement. Correct. Um, and yet that, uh, you know, I'm not even sure if it would be legally an option for schools to kind of defer to law enforcement in the sexual misconduct on campus area. But um, I know that there have been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of, to the extent that in the popular media people kind of raise that question of, you know, why aren't we just, why aren't schools just deferring to law enforcement and then depending on what the outcome of that is, um, then we can handle it. So I, if you yeah, could sure. just kind of address yeah. that Sure, issue. sure, sure. So, uh, schools already defer to police. Most of them have MOUs, memos, memorandums of understanding with their campus police or with the city police <clears throat> that uh, give them a short amount of time for them to, you know, either make a call where they, you know, they, the, 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 the <clears throat> person making the complaint will make a call and they record it and try to get them to admit that there was no consent that was going on or um, to be able to gather evidence to DNA or whatever it is that they need to do. Um, so, but you can have these short uh, time spans, but usually they don't sort of go on forever. Um, one of the things that the, that the uh, in the Olympic Committee, they would say, there is a, there's a statute that covers the Olympic movement. It's called the Ted Stevens Olympic and Amateur Sports Act. It was passed in 1978. And it says that <clears throat> before you can dismiss somebody from being part of the Olympic movement is you have to give them due process, which has been interpreted to mean sort of what we, would, it, would it think that people uh, in, in, in a AAA arbitration or in a civil court would be able to get, and there's a whole list, you can go Google it, as to what due process means. And so, P, so NGBs were using the Sports Act to say, we can't keep a very dangerous person in our, we can't keep them out of the Olympic movement because of the Amateur Sports Act. Now there was a process for getting them out. So one of the things that the statute does is it says, in the interim, if, there, if it's deemed that this is a dangerous person to children, that they have the option of being able to temporarily suspend them while the process continues. Um, you know, Larry Nasser, after, in 2015 is when the United States Olympic Committee first heard about him uh, molesting some of their Olympic gymnasts, Michaela Maroney and uh, Ali Reisman and some others. So they had official complaints in 2015. They didn't, the U.S. Olympic Committee did not go to the police, and they did not tell, um, they did not tell uh, uh, Michigan State. And so, we're, you know, that was like 50 more victims happened because they did not have this duty to report. So the, the statute does impl impose on them a duty to report to police, but they also have a duty to report to the national governing body so that if they need to take these interim actions to get them out of sport, that maybe, you know, the police, they don't have the power to be able to do it, but you got to get them away from kids, uh, that they can do it. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, so, Michael, the question of uh, what, are you, what are you hoping to see out of the department in the rulemaking coming up this year? I think the, the two main issues are, are closely related to each other. The first being the, the appropriate standard of proof, whether preponderance of the evidence should continue to be a permissible option, or rather uh, whether a school should be required to adopt a higher standard of proof, such as clear and convincing evidence. But I don't think you can look at that in isolation. I think that in considering what the appropriate standard of proof is, you need to look at that in conjunction with the other important issue, which is what is the substantive definition of the underlying offenses and how broadly can colleges be permitted to define the substantive underlying offenses. To the, the, the basically the broader you make the offense, the more you allow he said, she said type situations in the absence of violence, in the absence of extreme extreme situations like total incapacity, I think it becomes more important to have a higher standard of proof, a higher level of certainty, to the extent that the standard of proof is 
excuse me, to the extent that the substantive offense is defined more narrowly in more concrete and more objective terms, then there is at least an argument that you can have, have more of a preponderance of the evidence standard. Nancy had alluded to other types of offenses for which we see preponderance of the evidence. Drug possession, you have the drugs or you don't. Plagiarism, the, 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 the paragraph from your paper either is or is not identical to the paragraph from the book. To the extent you get into situations like the one we see in Brandeis, where a student was, was uh, accused of sexual assault because he, he woke his boyfriend up with a kiss, after they broke up, the boyfriend then had attended, some, had attended some sexual assault awareness sessions, and he decided that because he was sleeping, he couldn't consent to the kiss, and so therefore that constituted a sexual assault. To the extent that you see the, these types of rules being applied to a wider and wider range of situations, I think it calls for a reexamination of both ends, both the substantive definition of the offense as well as the requisite level of certainty that it was committed. Nancy, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, on that? I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, you can always talk about these outlier cases, and that's true that everything from death penalty all the way down to you know somebody getting fired. Um, you can talk about outlier cases, but I can tell you for the vast majority of, um, right, you're, um, that we know that, um, that uh, people lie about having been sexually assaulted or people exaggerate being sexually assaulted at the same race as any other crime. Two is there's been a lot of research on what do they look like what, when somebody's not being truthful. And typically somebody uh, who comes in and lies about having been raped is uh, what they need is social services. So they need housing, they need counseling, they need medical care. But um, right, so you're looking for, are they, is that really what they're trying to get? And usually they don't name, when, when somebody lies, out and out lies, they usually don't name who the perpetrator was. Uh, third is um, they, um, um, but, but sort of the, the, the narrative that, you know, women, and I, I, I represent champion women, so I understand that boys and men can certainly be sexually assaulted as well, but I primarily deal with women, um, that women, uh, you know, are, are um, you know, making it up or are falsifying or whatnot. It's just, it just does, it's not borne out by the evidence. It's not borne out by, um, by, by the research that's out there. This is, these are well-researched topics out there. And um, so, um, um, you know, I, I would, um, I, I think that having the same standard of preponderance of the evidence, uh, even for those outlier cases, makes the most sense, again, because you're talking about, I mean, you know, there are harms. I've represented defendants as well. I've represented uh, men who have been accused. And there are harms that come uh, as a result of that, and there are harms that come from a result, uh, as a result of being sexually assaulted. Frankly, I don't think they're equal. And, uh, and I think that, um, that the preponderance of the evidence will serve in both parties in these cases. So, um, so I think uh, in, when we see debates over the issue of the standard of proof, I think one of the things that I see a lot is that people generally would be more comfortable tending toward the preponderance if they had more confidence in the ability of the, each party to present evidence. And you know, we know in real life and other contexts like the ones Nancy was talking about, that's going to mean more lawyer involvement, more process, et cetera. And so I'm curious from Eamon's perspective, to the extent that these processes move more in that direction, what can you tell us about your views on kind of the institutional capacity of schools to be you know, adjudicating things where they're, you know, they're, instead of a lawyer just sitting there as kind of a, you know, a supporter who's not allowed to talk, to have a much more adversarial presentation and whether they're, whether they're equipped to actually handle that. I, I mean, from the university perspective, I think, one of the, I think one of the things that you need to see happen if you're going to go towards that route is that more training needs to be provided to the adjudicators who acts as judge, and it's usually a panel, right? It's usually a member of the administration, a representative from the student body, and a third part, uh, and a third individual in the university community. Those people will require a lot more training, because once you get it, lawyers involved, lawyers tend to complicate things. <laughs> I mean, it's just the reality. And one of the things, challenges we would have is we do try to protect the victim. I mean, or the alleged victim, if you would, in this case, because nothing's been judged, prejudged. But for example, we don't allow, right now, 
uh, an accused cannot ask questions directly of a victim. And so they have to submit their questions in advance and so forth. Once you start allowing lawyers to take a more active role, I think that whole dynamic changes. And you're, I don't think universities are set up or want to become a, a trial court. Because remember, what, what the university is trying to determine is who's likely more telling the truth and, the, the, and what discipline to issue. And the discipline can range from suspension to expulsion. And, but that's it. There's no jail. There is no, uh, no other substantive uh, repercussions on the accused. So I think you'd need more training for the adjudicators. And I think you'd need to set up the, uh, you'd need almost the rules of civil procedure. So I don't think it's viable to turn it into a much more adversarial system. Yeah, I think one of the things just from my own experience with this is uh, schools are wearing lots of different hats. You know, they're wearing right. the hat of trying to be supportive to the alleged victim. They have obligations to the accused. They're a funding recipient who has obligations to the federal government um, to make sure that they're complying with Title IX. They're also, you know, entities that care a lot about, um, uh, about uh, you know, making sure the public has confidence in how they're doing their job. And so they're, they're being asked in this area to do a lot of different things that can sometimes be in tension with each other and that uh, make their role very difficult. Can I add one more thing? I mean, one of the things, because we mentioned about victims potentially coming forth with a false story. Universities are very cognizant of that as well. And what's happened, I've seen cases where a victim comes forward with a, an allegation of sexual assault, an investigation happens, and it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt that she, that, that victim is lying. Then the disciplinary process, at the universities will shift it, and that victim that lied about the alleged assault will become the target of a disciplinary procedure. So universities are very cognizant of this and take it very seriously. So Can I add one thing? <clears throat> sure. And that is uh, one thing that, that um, you were talking about earlier was, you know, in a, in a drug case there's either drugs or there's not, and there's plagiarism, there either is plagiarism or there isn't. And people forget that, like, testimony is evidence. And when somebody says that that, that is evidence, and that um, what, well, I look at the Larry Nasser case, I look at, you know, the whole Me Too movement. So often when women come forward and say that they were sexually harassed or sexually assaulted, they are not believed. Larry Nasser told, all, told these girls, you just don't understand the difference between the inside of your vagina and your outside of your thigh. It was ridiculous that women wouldn't understand, or, you know, this is a, a genuine medical treatment here, and you just don't understand that this is a genuine medical treatment here. And um, so what, what, one of the first questions that, that um, I, I hear, even in child sexual cases, um, again, swimmers being six feet tall when they're 14 years old, is um, was it consensual? And consensual is completely irrelevant. It's just not even, uh, uh, right? It's like when somebody's passed out drunk. It's, it is an irrelevant question uh, on whether or not it was consensual. So um, I would agree with you that we do need uh, uh, just more training. I'm actually on the board of ATIXA, the Association of Title IX Administrators, and we provide a lot of training for schools on how to do this, and we run all kinds of, you know, um, right, but it's a three-day course and to have them kind <clears> of <throat> get up to speed and, and be able to run these in a way that's fair for both parties, in a way that does get out, you know, who is that between 2 and 8% of false reporters? And, uh, and, and who is it that we really need to get out of, this, out of this school because they're a danger to all women? We're almost out of time. Daniel, I see, is hovering over there. Is there anybody that wants to ask a question? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of the panel, for uh, being with us today. I, I want to preface my question to the panel by saying I started my professional career for the first eight years as a print media journalist. I very much believe in the First Amendment. However, have we reached a time in which we need to separate free speech from protest? Now, a protest that uh, if, if this gentleman here doesn't like what I have to say and he gets up and punches me in the mouth, there's no doubt that that's not free speech. That's not protected. That's criminal conduct. But what if he stands up and just starts shouting to where you can't hear me? Is that free speech or is that suppression of free speech? And if it's suppression of free speech, is that not the enemy of free speech that we should be able to criminalize and regulate? What if he, when I stood up to speak, stands in front of me with a baseball bat and glares at me and says, you're not going to approach the podium? Is that free speech or is that the enemy of free speech? 
And so what's happening now, what, what used to happen with protest is people would silently walk along the areas outside of where a speaker was speaking with signs that said something. That's free speech. If those people stand there with baseball bats to keep people from hearing the speaker, that's not free speech, that's criminal conduct. So when we talk about the price of universities having to provide security, uh, that is the price of free speech. And if they're going to have any free speech on any subject, they're going to have to provide security on the council, and it seems like criminalize that. What are your thoughts on drawing that distinction between free speech and suppression of free speech? Yeah, Jesse. Well, uh, it's a good point. Thanks, Ed. And, uh, you know, on, on that line, you know, none of this is all that difficult. We've been doing it for years in every context other than college campuses. If somebody, if a city grants uh, a permit to have a parade, you don't have a right to go lay across the parade route and shut that down. They have a right to be there. You can protest on the side. You can do things. We can apply common sense to college campuses, but again, because we've changed the role of what, you know, the students are, are consumers now instead of pupils. We don't want to make them uncomfortable and tell them we can't do anything. And on the subject of costs, I'll just say this. Tell me the last time a university in Florida did not have a football game because they thought it would cost a lot to have security there <laughs> to stop the Florida State fans from fighting with the UF fans. It is a bogus, I think it is mostly a, a bogus rationale. What's happening is the universities are refusing to impose real discipline on the people who are committing crimes. And so there is a moral hazard that results. If they would stand up, you know, when somebody goes to a football game, if a Gator fan and a Knoll fan get in a fist fight outside the game, what happens to them? They get thrown out and they get referred to the police. But if someone gets in a fist fight outside of a controversial speech, the university does nothing because they are afraid to say they took a stand. If they would take a stand, the security costs would go down and we wouldn't be having this debate. But they're refusing to do it because a lot of the administrators and faculty are encouraging and are part of these mobs. That is a fact. All right. All right. I knew I, I knew I could count on Jesse to finish strong. How's that so, for closing? So we'll, we'll end on that note. But thank you very much, guys. I'd, I'd like to